and everyone, hello, and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy program series kickoff. My name is Melissa Moore, and I'm Director of Education at the Figgy, and it is very good to connect with you all tonight for this exciting program. At the heart of all Figgy programs is the belief that art has the power to transform lives, especially during times of crisis and uncertainty. We have held this belief near and dear as we've begun to redefine what it looks like to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, especially when we can't always be together in person. So many of our programs that we've developed have been repackaged over the past few months. We hope you've enjoyed and continue to enjoy the assortment of offerings available through the Figgy's Virtual Museum. As we can, we'll begin hosting modified programs in the museum, such as in-person small group classes like those starting up next week. But for programs that need to accommodate larger groups of people, like our Thursday evening series, we're excited to host them online until we can determine that it's safe to conduct them in person at the museum once again. And uh, trust me, we are as eager as you to gather together in person so we can pick up where we left off in March. But until that time, please join us online as you are tonight and experience the transformative power of art as we continue to look, learn, and discover together. We are adding content to the Virtual Thursdays website every week, so check it often for up-to-date information and registration op options. And so you know, next week's program will feature Figgy assistant curator Vanessa Sage, who will introduce the exhibition Didier William Lacou and play a video interview she recorded with the artist, which will be followed by a live Q&A with Didier himself. This program will start at 6.30 p.m. and just like this week, you'll receive a link to join the program after you've registered. We're able to offer these Thursday programs at no cost to you thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, for that we're so grateful. Thank you. A few quick notes about the program tonight. Since this program is hosted in a webinar format, you can type any questions you have for the speakers into the Q&A box or the chat and we'll try to address them as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience on that. Also, I wanted to let you know that we are recording this session for archival purposes. So at this time, it is my great pleasure to turn things over to the Figgy's Director of Collections and Exhibitions, Andrew Wallace, who will be introducing the program this evening. Andrew, thanks for joining us. All right, well, um, thank you all for joining us, wh whoever you may be. Um, one of the things that is important about this exhibition is that we are trying to give you a sense, or it is our goal at least, to give you a sense of the, um, the West as we see it now, um, so to speak, the West that is rather than the West that was. And many of the photographers, um, including John, and as well the, um, uh, the director, Vim Vendors, all have a feeling about the West um, based on, as we do in America, on uh, the history, the lore, the stories, um, the myths that were created during the 19th century. One of the uh, key elements of this exhibition is to uh, sort of unpack some of those elements uh, and expose some of the, uh, the myth that was created uh, largely through landscape photography. One of the, uh, the photographers who's perhaps, whose work is most responsible for our misperception about the West, uh, whether that was intentional or not, is Carlton Watkins. Now Watkins was a, a, a California photographer, a San Francisco-based photographer who made many, many pictures of the West, some commercially, some great, uh, great surveys of of the American West commissioned by the, uh, the US government, but largely living through um, making images of uh, Yosemite, which is sort of the, the birthplace uh, of American landscape photography. Uh, so as we look at the exhibition, we try to explore some of that um, in, in our themes. But also there are other themes that we do not explore, uh, which um, if you're uh, attentive and you have an, a moment to see the exhibition and spend time in the space, uh, you will start to see other types of themes, other topics that come to the fore as you look at each photographer's work in contrast to uh, the others. 
Uh, so I think that's important. And one of the things that we don't really explore, but we're going to do that tonight with, with John, is we're going to think about photographers who work uh, in series um, and uh, talk to John about why uh, Carbon County, um, which is in Wyoming, was an important place for him to do his photo, photo exploration. Um, and, and I think that that is a, is a useful way of looking at or discovering how photographers think about their subjects and, and what makes them choose the images that they do choose. There are a number of photographers in this exhibition who, who have done the same. Uh, we don't necessarily, like in John's case, have, uh, you know, an, a large number of, of images of theirs to show that, uh, progression or that narrative that these photographers have tried to create, largely because the exhibition is fairly large. It's 150 images uh, right at this moment. Um, the catalog that eventually will come out about this exhibition has about 196 images in it. Uh, but those other photographers uh, include Victoria Sambuneris, uh, uh, Wim Wenders, the, the film director, um, uh, Wendy Redstar, um, who many of you may be familiar with, and um, another one, Roger Minnick, who has, uh, for the better part of his career, created a series he calls the um, the sightseeing sightseer series, and it uh, literally photographs all over the American West um, and elsewhere of people viewing the landscape, and it's a uh, it's an interesting. Uh, connection between the photographer viewing people viewing the subject. So um, with that, I'm going to read some, some words that uh, John uh, wrote for his, his Carbon County publication, which is a, a beautiful folio box with 24 signed and numbered uh, color photographs. Um, I do, John, is it still available? Can you, do you, do you know whether it's still available? Still available. So when speaking about his, his journey, John's journey to the West, um, he, he's thinking primarily about the myth of the West as he understood it uh, growing up. And so I'm going to quote him here, um, and then we're going to let John um, talk about his work and, and how he came to do what he did. So he writes, I strove to unburden myself from this flawed perception of the West as I began searching for a notion of a true West shaped through a better understanding of its history. During this journey, I found something different and startlingly current. In contrast to my false assumptions, a counterpoint between visions of the land and human ambition began to grow. The prison in Rollins, the fearless bull rider, hydrofracturing hydro water tanks, and the cowboy myth all harkened back to what I discovered to be a new contemporary reality of the frontier ideal. I no longer saw Carbon County merely as a place to pass through to get somewhere else, but rather as a fictitious example of our national ambition. So with that, I will uh, turn this over to John and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from John and any questions you may have at the end. Great. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Andrew Wallace, Director of Collections and Exhibitions, for uh, having me here to speak tonight at this event. And I'd also like to thank Melissa Moore for um, also organizing it. And uh, I couldn't be happier to have uh, two of my photographs in the exhibition. I was actually planning to go uh, to uh, Davenport and speak in part but because of all this has been going on, we had to reorganize it. So, but it's, I'm still very happy to be here. Um, tonight, I'm going to be speaking about uh, the two photographs, uh, which I have in exhibition. Um, they are drawn from, uh, like, uh, like Andrew said, they're drawn from a large body of work uh, called Carbon County, uh, which was published last year as a folio box and booklet. Uh, I spent about seven months uh, photographing uh, for this particular project. And uh, it is in the, uh, I did photograph in the U.S. state of Wyoming for that amount of time. And I'm going to go into a little more detail about uh, the Carbon County project specifically uh, a little bit later. 
Um, but I really wanted to start out uh, discussing a little bit about my background as a photographer and uh, an artist. And I'm just going to do a sh screen share here. So, I hope everyone can see my slideshow. So I, I began, um, we're good, Andrew? You can see that we're good. All right, great. Um, okay, so I wanted to start out with my personal background, which I think is uh, interesting, uh, you know, from uh, hearing from many artists, but uh, this is a photograph of the, uh, pre-war apartment building, which I uh, spent uh, uh, my uh, majority of my life in, in uh, Midtown Manhattan. I grew up there. Um, if you see uh, right between the uh, two skyscrapers, there's a tiny little uh, building that's kind of sandwiched in between there. And um, this is uh, this is where I grew up. And uh, I photographed this actually from the top of Rockefeller Center. And uh, well, when I saw this, how the building was, was sliced in between there, I was pretty struck with how, uh, how neatly it fit in there. But I did grow up in midtown Manhattan. Um, uh, during my early childhood, uh, there was always um, this sense of uh, going out of the city and getting away. And we would often go on road trips uh, to nearby Pennsylvania and the Hudson Valley. And this influence uh, that was mostly given to be obviously by my parents who uh, also enjoy being out and exploring the world uh, surrounding the city um, really stuck with me uh, throughout my life and uh, in uh, my early explorations as a photographer uh, as I was growing up in Midtown Manhattan were visiting the, uh, the nearby areas of the Hudson Valley and uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania Particularly in Pennsylvania, I visited these places uh, with my father. And uh, when I began photography around age 13 or 15, uh, I had been um, actually creating this, this idea in my head of these places that we had visited. And uh, I, kind of, I kind of figured that that was uh, my first kind of aesthetic experience was uh, creating these imaginary places in my head. And when I discovered photography, I was able to uh, actually communicate that. And um, so there's in my work, there is that that draw between the city and the, uh, you know, the uh, periphery areas. Um, also growing up in New York, uh, it's important to know for me, I think, uh, being surrounded by the huge grid of architecture and uh, the street grid and uh, the scale of these, this place and, uh, you know, being, being kind of small uh, within the city um, and kind of being humbled by it in a way uh, was really uh, uh, important to me. And a lot of my work, you'll see that I, even in the rural areas and most, uh, most desolate areas, I always still kind of look for this uh, architecture or, or built element uh, of uh, humanity that kind of anchors the photograph in many ways. Um, Yes, yeah, so that's uh, a little bit about where I uh, where I grew up. I mean, um, so my early work, uh, I started photography when I was around uh, 13 or 15 years old uh, with a 35 millimeter uh, a film camera, SLR. Um, and I began revisiting these places that I had uh, visited in adolescence uh, with my parents, uh, particularly my father. And uh, I just started going back to these places in Pennsylvania and a lot of uh, our collective experience uh, was uh, the railroad, the American Railroad, and um, it, the romance of it, as well as the excitement of the actual train and being in these environments was very influential for me. So as I was developing early on as a photographer, I was photographing these places. And I also went to the Hudson River Valley. This is a photograph in Newburgh, New York. But even here on, I, early on, I'm, uh, I can quite see where I was developing these uh, these formal rules and these compositional elements that I uh, would apply later on to some of my uh, uh, more developed projects. This is another view of uh, the Hudson River area near Albany. 
And even, even during this early time, I was looking at uh, places that had a significance in terms of the, uh, uh, the social history of the United States, as well as uh, the, um, the aesthetic uh, actual power of the place. So in a lot of my work, there is, there is a uh, contrast between documentary mode and sort of poetic mode. And um, poetic in the sense that uh, I use light in a certain way that's important for me in, in the photographs. And uh, also in this, this early image, I can kind of see where I, I liked it particularly because it has, has sort of a metaphorical quality to it where the, um, the actual passenger train is being kind of subsumed by this interstate highway that, is, uh, that has been built across the, uh, across the Hudson River and the railroad tracks. In this early work, I was really kind of trying to show how the train has been superseded in uh, many respects by uh, surrounding technology and uh, transportation. Uh, in 2009 was uh, sort of a pivotal year for me in my uh, in my work. Uh, I had been shooting the railroads uh, and the trains uh, previous to that for for many many years and. Um, I reached the point where I was just up, up against the brick wall. I was, you know, I was shooting black and white. I was really, I didn't feel like I was adding anything more to the genre of photography and specifically to the uh, genre of like railroad photography. But there was still that need in my, you know, in my uh, soul that where I, I wanted to say something about the railroad. And uh, there was something in that landscape that was really speaking to me. And I didn't, with this early work, the trains, I really wasn't saying what I wanted to say. So I began, um, I went on this trip and, uh, and took this photograph of these, uh, the steam locomotive. And during the, during the same trip, on the way back to New York City, I had about two days of complete overcast. The light was terrible and I didn't make any photographs. And um, I was driving along uh, Route 5, going back to New York City. Um, but it was, this is in Buffalo, so western New York City. And the sky had cleared out, and the sun was just starting to come through and sort of illuminating the landscape and the architecture and the buildings. And it just things started to come alive. And uh, this was actually the first trip also where I was using the large format view camera, which is a tripod camera. It's a traditional uh, camera where you use a duck cloth in the back, and you have film holders. And so this is the first trip where I was using a different this different camera in, uh, in a specific way. And during this uh, drive through Buffalo, I, I saw this uh, scene here of a uh, steel, uh, steel mill and these row houses uh, that were in front of the, uh, of the old structure. And I took this photograph uh, with my, uh, my view camera and I actually shot it in color and black and white. And it was with this photograph that I really, decided to pursue color, a large format photography, uh, you know, as, as my main, uh, my main tool for producing, uh, prints. Uh, one reason also was the fact that with the large format film camera, you have large negatives, so you can actually produce large, uh, fine art prints, which after seeing several exhibitions, including, uh, the work by Edward Bertinsky, uh, his manufactured landscape series, and the ability to make these large format prints really stuck with me. So um, that was part of my transition into uh, shooting specifically with large format. So I made this photograph in 2009. And from this point onward, I really didn't go back to doing with the trains. And um, though I do, did revisit trains a few years later in a different kind of uh, uh, mode. And this, this, this photograph particularly also laid the foundation for another project uh, called National Character, which I'll discuss uh, in a minute. So after I had been uh, photographed in 2009 and I was pursuing large format photography and just going back into the landscape trying to uh, figure out what I wanted to say about the American Railroad, I began to uh, photograph uh, the project called Railroad Landscapes, which is uh, some of these images here. So I began to, I actually decided to actually leave the train out completely up from the, I tried to include more things within the frame. Because previous to this, I was really very particular and very narrowly focused 
on producing images that had uh, impact in a very, um, a very like modernist way, um, sort of like more like the work of uh, Edward Weston and, and uh, Minor White and these kind of guys were really influential to me. And so with this project, I kind of backed up and I just wanted to kind of let the place, you know, speak for itself in a way. And um, so I produced this body of work, uh, the road landscape. And I started to include the panorama aspect ratio because I was using the uh, railroad tracks as kind of, of a gestural element within the track, within the picture, which gives it, uh, which I hope gives kind of the images kind of a flow from each, uh, each photograph. And again, in these last two pictures, I was returning to the Hudson River Valley to photograph. So I revisited a lot of the places that I had uh, photographed in black and white with the 35 millimeter camera. Again, with the large format camera and this new uh, approach that I, uh, that I was taking. And I also do quite a bit of diptychs and pairings to kind of show the, the, uh, the, um, the te these territories that are adjacent to the railroad. But there is that sense that the tracks are always kind of bringing you somewhere else, which I think is a very American thing uh, that I really connect to. This is an ongoing project. Uh, this picture is from 2019. Uh, this is a view of uh, a borough uh, right, right outside of New York City uh, called Queens. Uh, and uh, it's a look uh, at this industrial corridor. As I developed the railroad project, uh, I decided uh, you know, that I really needed to go to the Midwest to, uh, to really get more of a holistic uh, view of the American Railroad, because I knew there was just a lot more out there. Um, and so uh, around 2015, I began uh, going out to the Midwest. Uh, I had a scholarship from the uh, Center for Railroad Photography and Art, which is based out of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And I just, I'm very thankful for their support. And they allowed me to actually go to the Midwest uh, two times to photograph. And I created this, this is a coaling tower in Mary, Ohio, and these uh, structures were used to resupply coal-powered uh, coal steam locomotives, and these were built around the 1920s, uh, a lot of which still remain. Um, there's a photographer named Jeff Browse, who has been a huge influence on me, and he has an entire series of images that document these uh, coaling towers throughout the United States. So that's I definitely uh, would look into his work. He's amazing. And um, so this is a, another view of a, showing how the territory of the railroad is so adjacent and close to the uh, to cities and towns and people's lives. This is another new photograph of a flood wall near the Ohio River in New Boston, uh, Ohio. This is from last December 2019. I also decided to go farther south. This is a view of the Overseas Railway in the Florida Keys. No idea. This, uh, this actual railroad was built by the industrialist uh, Henry Flagler in the 1920s uh, to connect Miami with Key West. Um, this is a quite a beautiful structure uh, that's still there. Um, unfortunately, the railroad line that passed through is actually um, destroyed. Part of the, the um, bridge was destroyed uh, by a hurricane, and I believe in the 1940s. And but, uh, many of these uh, structures were repurposed to carry the uh, highway that connects the Cape West to the South West Virginia. And here we start going out west. So in 2015, uh, I actually uh, also decided to go out west. Um, and with the with the help of an artist residency at uh, Brush Creek Ranch, Wyoming, I was able to travel uh, travel there and photograph. So on the way out to Wyoming, I uh, created a very careful route of uh, locations that I wanted to photograph out there. Uh, and I was particularly interested at this time in photographing the railroad landscape. So this is actually the first photograph I made as I was traveling west where I felt like I was actually entering the west. And this is a view in uh, Chamberlain, South Dakota. And our view kind of stretches westward towards the Black Hills. Also South Dakota. Incidentally, this is also taken on the same, uh, same day as the previous photograph. 
so when I'm working, and there's sometimes there's days where I don't find anything, and then there will be a couple. It'll be like a you know, one afternoon you'll have like five opportunities for photographs, and it's just like when you're out there in the elements, and it's uh, you're quite um, you're quite uh, vulnerable to to the weather, and, uh, and this is a view of a uh, grain elevator in Cerro, Oklahoma. This is from 2017. Uh, I photographed this on the way back from Wyoming after photographing Carbon County. So, so Wyoming. This is the final image that I, I show you from the railroad work. Uh, this is a view of Bootlegger Tunnel in Moab, Utah. My other project is National Character. I'm just going to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, this is a this project uh, stemmed out of the uh, steel mill and houses uh, photograph that I spoke about earlier, um, where I started looking at the uh, these places uh, beyond the railroad. But actually, while I was following the railroad, I actually was led to these other places. So the, the railroad kind of in my in my work has kind of acted as kind of like this artery uh, from which I was able to explore these other regions of the United States and create, uh, you know, another body of work. And in this project, I started uh, including more portraiture as well. Uh, this is a particularly uh, popular uh, photograph from the project. It's a look at uh, a place called the Iron Triangle in Willis Point, Queens, which is part of New York City. Uh, it used to be a center for auto repair shops and uh, truck yards and uh, really like when you would go in there and drive in there with your car, I mean, it was really like entering like an old West town. It was really amazing. And uh, early on in my childhood, I remember my father would take me here quite frequently to buy bars for his pickup truck. Um, so, this is a view of the uh, United States Naval Museum in Pensacola, Florida. So, throughout this project, I'm really looking at how, as a society, we, you know, what do we value? I mean, uh, you know, what is, what are, how do we hold up our heritage? I mean, you know, what are this, what does the topography, topography of the United States look like? I mean. Like in this photograph in uh, near Bluefield, West Virginia, you have the shopping mall in the background and sort of this, uh, the church on the right and this, the house in the, in the foreground. And it's like this really bizarre dichotomy between these different elements that uh, I love going out and trying to find and explore. This is a view in West Virginia of a pipeline clearing. And there's nothing really in this image, I think, that makes it like a historically important image or anything, but uh, the juxtaposition between these different elements is just found kind of very interesting. And uh, this is another sort of a humorous image for me. Uh, this is a Greyhound Museum in Hibbing, Minnesota. And going back to how this project kind of speaks to the, uh, how the United States uh, as a country kind of remembers our heritage. Uh, this. Uh, Greyhound Museum constructed this artificial uh, Greyhound bus stop, um, which uh, I think is kind of funny because it's uh, it looks less than realistic, but it's still something that's uh, uh, held up as kind of this symbol of of our past. Estonia's uh, former A and W uh, root beer um, mascot. And he was repurposed uh, for some some other nefarious uh, thing. And this is the last photograph of this project I'm going to show you. This was taken uh, actually on on the way to Wyoming in 2017 to photograph uh, Carbon County. All right, now we get to the uh, heart of the matter. <laughs> so uh, Carbon County uh, began for me in 2015. Uh, well, uh, when I got artist residency in uh, Brush Creek Ranch, uh, Wyoming, which is in Carbon County. Um, during my time there, I made a photograph of uh, a lady and her Great Dane. Uh, her name is Kimitha. 
and which I'll, sh I'll show you the uh, photograph in a minute. But I made this photograph for her, and she seemed to carry this uh, this sort of um, symbol, or this uh, this kind of emblematic uh, persona of of being an American Western woman. And I made a photograph for her, and it just it stuck in my mind for for over a year. And I I'd always wanted to go back to Wyoming to photograph the place more because it just it really struck struck in my mind. Uh, and actually going back to being a kid, I mean the idea of the myth of the American West had just really followed with me throughout my life. Uh, you know, from seeing the westerns that my father watched, like flickering on the TV set. Um, you know, the William Tell overture, um, you know, the beauty of the Native Americans, you know, the, the tragedy of the Native Americans, the story behind that, uh, the wildlife, the buffalo. So it was like, being an American boy, it's kind of like, you can't really, I couldn't anyway, I don't know how it is now, but it was hard to really avoid that. And I think because my, my father was of, uh, he was born in 1939, so he was a little bit when they had me, he was quite a bit older than I think other kids of my generation. So he, I think he carried with him this little bit different of a appreciation for a different era in American history. So as I developed, I kind of brought that with me. And um, yes, yeah, so after my residence, uh, residency, uh, my uh, my wife saw that uh, Brush Creek Ranch uh, was hiring as a staff photographer. So I went back and. Uh, photographing uh, for the ranch as well as photographing uh, this Carbon County project. So this Carbon County is the, is the sequence of photographs I'm going to go through here. I hope, I hope it wasn't too long-winded. Um, uh, in terms of the sequence of the photographs, the, uh, the first images of the railroad that passed through Wyoming because the arrival of, of the railroad in 1869 was a pivotal moment in the history of the United States of Wyoming, of Garment County. And uh, that's one reason why we wanted to start off with the railroad in the uh, project as we, as we develop the book. This is uh, a view westward uh, from Saratoga, Wyoming, of the, uh, the light and the, the uh, sky. Um, and going back to my earlier work, there is, uh, there is the natural uh, quality of the landscape just opposed with this uh, aspect of the built environment, which are these light, light posts that are situated there. This is the photograph of uh, Kimitha and her great Dame Wyatt, which was taken in 2015. And this is the image that really stuck with me and uh, really, I think in many ways, brought me back to, uh, back to Wyoming. Um, The horizon line throughout the photographs uh, really ties all together as one of the main motives of the project. Uh, you know, coming from New York City, I mean, where well, you don't see the horizon very often, and it's just like going out west, it was uh, something that I, was really hard to avoid. And uh, every morning I would get up and it would be like, you know, I'd see it and it'd just be like, it would be there, and it would just be so, such an inspiration, so, uh, so motivating to just get out there and, and use a horizon in, in these different ways. Um, this is a view of uh, a road northward that reaches out of Barham County. Um, in the uh, 18, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, uh, just north of here beyond that mountain range, uh, ran the Oregon Trail, which brought uh, so many uh, uh, settlers that were going west to Utah, California, Oregon, and uh, this landscape itself has been so uh, and is so rugged and um, inhospitable that uh, it has mostly been used for people that are going somewhere else. So it was particularly interesting for me uh, to experience that. Um, so when I was out there photographing, I had this, I, this feeling that it was desolate and it was unknown and it was uh, very, uh, very uh, unknown for me. But at the same time, I felt like there's something there to find. And, I, and uh, 
just kind of stopping stopping along the road and you know understanding what Harvey County is about was uh, a big thing for me. This is a ranch dog uh, that uh, lived on the ranch and worked on the ranch that I was uh, working at. This project, again, like like in the national character, I started using, uh, uh, including more literature in, in the project. So there is the, uh, in the West, there is the, um, the idea of the, uh, the uh, the conquest of the West uh, by the United States and uh, you know so this name which kind of references that I think in many ways but um, and then you have sort of the prison which follows next in the sequence so it's kind of like the idea of ambition and then there's a limit of the ambition um, which you know is taken to its you know the darkest degree would be you know these outlaws and these criminals that were brought actually to Carbon County and the West uh, through the arrival of the railroad. Um, this is a prison uh, in the, the Wyoming State Penitentiary in Rawlins, uh, Carbon County, Wyoming, which uh, held uh, a lot of uh, a lot of bad guys uh, during the American uh, frontier days. Um, one of the last uh, great train robbers was a guy named uh, Bill Carlisle. He was known as the Gentleman Bandit. He was also known as the White Mask Bandit. So he would rob. Uh, the uh, Union Pacific uh, train passenger trains that were running along uh, the uh, the uh, main line here through Rollins, but he would be very careful not to uh, take money from anyone who he deemed uh, couldn't uh, couldn't uh, um, couldn't de uh, deal uh, with losing it, like uh, women or children. I mean, one time he. Uh, uh, he was arriving a train, I think it was in 1919, and it was uh, filled with uh, service members uh, arriving back from World War I, and he was just like, yes, let them go. And, uh, so it's very interesting, very interesting history. Uh, these are two ranch boys uh, in, in Wyoming. Again, the, the cowboy appears in this project throughout in, in various modes. Um, as the cowboy appears in, uh, you know, American history in different modes, I mean, you have the cowboy as a poet, you have the cowboy as the cattle rancher, you have the cowboy as a bandit, the outlaw, um, and here he's, uh, he appears as kind of like this princely uh, figure in the, uh, in the arena. And you'll see the cowboy reappears in, in different forms. Uh, this is the memorial, uh, Alas Muertos, uh, it's a memorial that was uh, painted on a bridge in Rollins, Wyoming. Uh, it was dedicated to uh, a corrections officer that was killed by escaping prisoners at the, the Wyoming, the Wyoming uh, State Penitentiary. Not the one that was pictured, there's a new one that was replaced by that one. Uh, so this is one of the photographs uh, that appears in the Magnetic West exhibition. And I think it's, you know, it's interesting to me because it's, it does tie into that history of, you know, how we, uh, how we as a nation kind of and, um, I'm sure Andrew could speak a little bit more about uh, this particular image. But uh, in terms of the, uh, in the sequence of the Carbon County photographs, it's, it's very important because it does speak to the West and how people have uh, suffered there and how people have toiled and, and not only going through and trying to go somewhere else, but actually trying to live there. And, uh, you know, this, this officer may not have been, you know, doing anything like, uh, you know, travel or anything, but he was, he was living in that area. And uh, his story is just as important as anything else. Um, this is a, actually a self-portrait of the photographer as a truck driver. So this is the a cemetery in Old Carbon, Wyoming. Old Carbon was uh, one of the original towns that was built along uh, the Transcontinental Continental Railroad as it was being built um, around 1900 uh, when the railroad realigned its, 
its right of way a little bit farther north because they uh, had uh, new engineering uh, techniques. The town was pretty much abandoned. Uh, there's still a lot of ruins there from structures, but the cemetery remains and uh, it's still actually uh, open to uh, new arrivals. But um, yeah. And here's uh, an interesting photograph from the project, also because this is the cowboy. He is, as he appears as the executive. So it's sort of a new uh, modern age kind of contemporary cowboy, where he's the cowboy businessman. These are three, uh, three, uh, three crosses um, of a church uh, called Right on Faith that sits sort of uh, in the shadow of uh, the Medicine Bow Mountain Range, which is what you see in the, in the background there. So this photograph just, uh, you know, I mean, as I said, I've been interested in, you know, photographing at the time period between, uh, you know, twilight and the transition from day to night has always been very interesting to me. Um, and this particular photograph, I mean, beyond that, it is interesting because it does speak to like the colonial foundation of the West and the role of religion as well in, in, in a place. Uh, this photograph is called Cow Drive. Uh, this is another image. Uh, that appears in the Magnetic West exhibition. Um, so um, in this photograph, uh, I was, uh, the making of it was interesting because I was actually in my car and I was uh, following this cattle drive that was occurring along the roadway and I was just sitting while the cowboys were driving these cattle up across the road. And I noticed this one guy was very interesting to me because he had like, these sunglasses on, wraparound sunglasses and a camouflage top and uh, jacket and, uh, you know, he, he's, he had this look that was really very, very like, uh, you know, urban kind of in a way. And uh, I say he's urban cowboy or anything. Like, I don't want to talk about John Travolta right now, but, uh, <laughs> um, but I was photographing, I was following him in my car and I was able to uh, capture this moment when he's frozen uh, in the window. And uh, it was quite a challenge to make this particular photograph um, but I just love, you know, how it brought out so much of, uh, what it is to be, you know, an American and like traveling through this place. And, you know, with the one that's kind of sentimental in a way, cause it's looking at the Cowboys, uh, through the window is kind of like, this, just like this flash, like this sentimental moment where he's, uh, you know, you know, it's, uh, very, uh, very poignant for me. Um, and, you know, when I was out there photographing this, this actual picture uh, was of a larger series of photographs that I was taking of the, the view outside of the window of my car. And I must, I probably taken at least 60 of those photographs. And this is the only one that uh, actually made it into the, into the book. And again, in this project, you can see I'm actually using uh, flash photography in many of the photographs, which is a technique that I started uh, using out there in Carbon County, and it's something that I'm actually applying to my work uh, currently. These are the hydro fracturing tanks that um, Andrew mentioned uh, in the essay. And natural gas extraction is a, is a major industry out there, so. This is a photograph of Ramon, Brush Creek Ranch. I met Ramon at the ranch I was working at, and he's a very interesting guy. Uh, he was a cook, um, and uh, this day I photographed him. Uh, you know, he was so he was so elegantly dressed. You know, with his uh, snakeskin cowboy boots and uh, you know the rhinestone belt and. Uh, so, you know, plaid shirt, and, uh, you know, I was asking him what's going on, and it, apparently he had gotten in trouble, and uh, they, were, they were actually going to let him go, so this was actually the last day that he was working at the ranch, and uh, I was lucky enough to take his photograph. This is uh, one of the final photographs in the Kern County, you know, project, and um, this is up in the Medicine Bow Mountains. Um, and it's really important for me because, uh, you know, throughout the history of the American West, the natural places have been demolished, have been, you know, stricken down 
to build this, you know, this Western empire of the, the United States now, you know, enjoys in, in many ways. Um, this actual forest was once decimated to supply the uh, cross ties to the railroad that was being built. Um, it's uh, the north of this location along the Transcontinental Railroad. And this actual, um, today when I took this, this forest was actually decimated by uh, beetles, an invasive beetle species that destroyed the forest. That's a uh, rodeo scene of a cowboy exiting the arena. This is a view of us uh, Wyoming where we're living. And this is the, these are some of the last images of the project uh, where I'm kind of recapitulating the uh, the idea of the West as, uh, you know, as a natural uh, symbol of, of, of the, uh, you know, the, of the country. In Carbon County, the Carbon County sign is the last uh, photograph of the, of the series. Um, and I did love Carbon County as a title because it does have kind of a, uh, you know, a double meaning where, you know, in this country, we're always kind of looking for resources and experience. And I saw Carbon as that, as that reference. And county obviously is a uh, local boundary, so I felt like Carbon County was this, uh, this end, sort of to our, you know, an inevitable end to our, you know, our search for for experience, resource, and within the borders of Carbon County, I really felt like uh, I, uh, you know, I could uh, photograph that that experience. So I'm just going to speak a little bit about. Uh, the publication we made last year uh, was published by the Tar Press uh, as a carbon, as a folio box and a booklet. This is the folio box, 14 by 14 inches. We wanted to design it after the traditional folios of uh, Ansel Adams um, and his uh, his other in the American West uh, during the mid 20th century. These are just some of the uh, images. This is all uh, letter pressed uh, text. And the actual photographs are eight by 10 inches. And the boxes are, is an addition of 50 boxes that we made with uh, a few uh, artist proofs. And this is the booklet version of the box. So it includes the same photographs. And we envision this uh, item as a way for me to go back to Wyoming eventually and do exhibitions uh, in Carbon County and actually have these, this booklet available uh, to people so that, uh, to the people of Carbon County so that they can actually, you know, have something to give back to the community there that, you know, gave me so much, allowed me to photograph their land and uh, the people there, which I'm incredibly thankful for. These are some of the spreads in the booklet. Just a few, this is one of my recent projects I'm working on, on uh, the Staten Island Ferry, which is a ferry service that runs from Manhattan Island to Staten Island in New York City. And it's a look at the, uh, it's a 25 minute journey from uh, end to end. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, ferry and I mean, it's just, as you as you imagine, New York City is a very eclectic, very diverse place, and on the ferry you really experience this uh, this momentum and this energy, and so many different people. And uh, the light is amazing because you're on the in the, on the water, so you get the very distinct shadow light. And I am using the the uh, small format camera with flash for this project. Then I'm kind of looking back to that like kind of a uh, aesthetic of Bruce Davidson and um, you know. Photographers like that who worked uh, very loosely and very quickly. So this is an ongoing body of work. Um, it's about, I guess ninety percent photographed. So. The last one of them, gentleman was. Uh, it was 
very interesting character. And I just want to say thank you, uh, you know, for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'd love to go. I could go on and on, you know, but I don't, I'm not going to do that. But I just wanted to, uh, you know, dedicate this to my sons, uh, John and William. Um, uh, that's William on the left and John on the right. And, uh, you know, since they were born, I feel like I've been making my best photographs and they've just made me a better man, and better husband, better person. So I just want to give a shout out to them. That's all I have for now. <laughs> John, thank you so much for that, for sharing that with our audiences. I know some of them have had a chance to see your works in person. Some are, are eagerly anticipating their first visit to the museum to do so. And we do have a couple questions. Do you have time to, to take those? Yeah, definitely. Wonderful. So the first is from Norm. He asks, in your railroad images, how did you research the locations? Was it hit or miss online? Other photo books? Uh, railroad work, you know, a lot of it is, you know, a lot of it's serendipity and just going out and looking because I can kind of find, you know, I know where the industrial areas are. I know, you know, and so it's just, most of it is serendipity and just going and finding a general area, like an industrial area, or if I want to photograph, you know, something like, um, you know, an urban environment, like Columbus, Ohio, I know what it's, I know what's there, you know, in a general way, but actually to make the photograph, you, you just have to be there and look to see, really. So it's kind of a combination of both, I'd say. <laughs> And I think that kind of leads into the next question, which is, do you always carry a camera with you? Uh, not always, no, not always, not always. But I do, uh, most recently, uh, I've been trying to carry my small camera with me around the city, just because I've been doing a lot of ferry work on the ferry, so it's just convenient to have, so. Yeah, well, that was from um, Brian. And then from Kathy, we have, you mentioned flash photography usage. Could you expand on that? Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, when I was starting out in photography, I was looking at the work of like oh, Winston Link, who photographed in uh, Southern U US, and he had these very elaborate flashbulb setups. And he photographed these huge scenes of uh, rural American life. Um, and he always said that he was frustrated because he could never control the sun. So he, he was able to do this with all these flash bulbs. And um, so I feel with flash photography, it, it kind of gives me that, that freedom to, uh, to you create my own, my own light. And coming from uh, a background where I was shooting large format and everything was about natural light and just the natural moment, I'm really responding uh, very you know, this very viscerally to the uh, the use of flash because I think it's has a lot of potential and like, power. But at the same time, I feel like it's uh, it's one of the the most invasive and one of the most obnoxious methods of working because like if you're working with people, they're going to know you're taking photographs. So you, you got to be prepared for that for that other element that that might occur. You know, confrontation or whatever it may be. So it's a good question though. <laughs> So another one from Brian. Do you ever take photographs with your phone? Uh, I do. Uh, yeah, I take photographs with my phone, but mostly just for uh, reference. Yeah, nothing, nothing for, uh, nothing for my phone becomes a print or a work. You know, so. And um, you mentioned how it can be a bit. Um, how people know when you're taking photographs of them, especially with the flash. We have a question yeah. here. Do you talk with the people and ask permission to publish their images and how do people typically respond? Um, with the, uh, 85% of the time I don't. The reason why is uh, particularly with the fairy photos, I'm working in such a way that I'm not really interested in, you know, necessarily having someone aware that I'm there. It's more about capturing this, this kind of repose in a way or this fleeting moment that exists. 
And uh, so I'm, I'm really just there to observe. So I'm not, uh, whereas like in Carbon County, I was more enmeshed in the community because I was living there for, you know, extended amount of time. So I was more, you know, I was more involved in that aspect with the people. Um, but in a, you know, in, with I'm just there, like, I'm just looking for these moments just to capture very, very quickly. Well, um, Norm is wondering about the intense dog in Carbon County and whether or not it was friendly, if you have any scars. He says it looks uh, like it could have gone either way. Yeah. <laughs> he was, uh, he was uh, friendly on the verge of not being friendly, I guess, in a way. I don't know. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure when I took the photograph if you know if I was gonna go home in an ambulance or something. <laughs> no, he was just he was, he was a good guy. He would uh, he would chase his shadow around the ranch all day, so I think he was pretty harmless. But <laughs> okay, so how about the timing for the Staten Island Ferry Project? Rory would like to know. Uh, the timing. Mm -hmm. uh, well. Uh, I really started photographing it, you know, after I returned from Wyoming in 2017. Uh, I think having that that experience out west, uh, you know, being surrounded by the open the openness and the you know that environment, and then coming back to the city, I was like, you know, I was just like, I was struck with it. I think in many ways, the diversity, the you know, the the, the people, and because uh, I had, you know, I grew up in the city, so it was kind of like uh, I kind of took it for granted, maybe in some ways. So coming back from Wyoming, I think I had like a refreshed uh, mind for, you know, to create that fairy work. And when you do that, um, we have another question that kind of goes back to the interaction between you and, and the subject matter. You have to obtain signatures in order to share photographs or images with people. I'll say it again, sorry. No, that's okay. You have to obtain signatures to share someone's image. Uh, only if it's for uh, commercial use. Yeah, generally. I mean, it's, yeah. All right, we have a few more. Are you still, are you still doing okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Hey, we have a great audience tonight. All right, That's so, good. um, is there a chance you would want to raise your children in the West? Uh, most definitely, yeah. I think it would be an amazing place to uh, raise my two boys in, so, yeah. I mean, I wish they were old enough to actually remember what it was like there. I mean, they were, on, they were turned a year old in Wyoming, so, you know, they were still very young, so. <laughs> um, so we have, to get to all of those railroad locations with no people or traffic, do you have to wait a long time, and do you ever give up or consider giving up? Uh, the locations, uh, most of the time, you know, I'm driving to them. So, um, yeah, it's, it really is, I rarely give up on anything unless like the day is pretty much, you know, nothing's happening in terms of the light or the weather. Or a lot of the locations, I mean, it's worth to be noted that, you know, I'll go back to a lot of places like several times before I actually, you know, get a photograph that speaks to what I'm, after in a way um but like if i'm on the road or something like far away i mean it's that's not really possible so i do have to be a little more careful about you know when am i going to arrive at the certain location that i had planned out like the but i knew that i had to be there you know at dawn uh, um, in order to achieve the photograph that i wanted because of the way the canyon would be lit and stuff so All right, so two that I'm going to kind of put together here. Has COVID affected your working and what's next? Oh, COVID, man, wow. Yeah, I would say it definitely affected my, uh, my work. Um, it's just, you know, it's just pretty much everything. I mean, I had an exhibition planned in the city here, which I had to uh, postpone. Uh, it was set to open uh, May 1st and um, the city too has just been so quiet and very, very empty and there's like no energy in the streets. 
And like, for, if I was going to go photograph on the ferry, it's just like not interesting right now. It really isn't because it really is about the energy and the life of the ferry, which is, you know, which is based after the, you know, the city I and mean, the energy of the city uh, just keeps it all uh, revolving. Um, so what's next is, you know, I'm just uh, trying to get through this and, uh, um, you know, editing constantly. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm constantly writing about my work and uh, yeah. And just, you know, just trying to weather this situation. I mean, that's all I can say. <laughs> That's about all any of us can say these days, yeah. and we appreciate you, your candidness with that. All right, so um, two here that again, kind of going, go together, um, you know, whether or not you use local guides in Wyoming and, and then your impressions of the West and how they may have changed you being a city boy. Uh, I did use local guides kind of like to get an idea of like different locations. Uh, to photograph there, but a lot of what I was basing my, uh, you know, my work on was uh, actually just doing research and uh, reading about these different areas um, and uh, just like driving around and, you know, experiencing it firsthand. Um, I don't think I mentioned, but I do have a political science background. So I've been like really influenced by the this work of social geographers uh, like J.B. Jackson and uh, John Stilgo who write about the built environment and they're all about the experience of it and going out and seeing it for yourself and really analyzing it. And so I think I bring a lot of that uh, background into my you know, photograph photographic process. Um, how the city is, uh, how the, how I, the second question was about the West. Um, in some ways I feel like, you know, I live, I've grown up in this city, but perhaps it's not like, you know, where my heart is in many ways. And, uh, you know, I think that's a lot of, in the work that I make, uh, a lot of that is, I think, that exploration of, you know, like I said earlier about, like, something's out there to be found. And uh, it's always brought me out. And, uh, you know, being out West was, uh, was one of the most, uh, you know, powerful moments, like, for me in that experience. So uh, that answers. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we do have another one here. What's your method for sequencing and distilling a body of work? How does it feel done? Which I know is a, a hard question for all artists to answer. Yeah, that's um, sequencing is, uh, you know, it's to be honest, it was uh, something that, you know, I really improved on with the Carbon County project because this was the first time where I was including um, sort of an elliptical narrative in the work where I was including portraits, you know, I was including landscapes, I was including uh, these buildings or these places. So it was a challenge for me to uh, come up with that sequence with my publisher, uh, you know, uh, Zatara Press, based out of Richmond, Virginia. Um, and uh, so we, it was a collaborative effort, uh, you know, constructing the book. And the process for that was, you know, we would just lay out all the photographs. I mean, I probably took over uh, 250 images while I was out in Carbon County, just printing them all out as like, you know, four by five prints uh, from Adorama and then just like going through like sequencing by color, sequencing by subject and, uh, you know, slowly, slowly just whittle away at the, uh, you know, at the entire body of uh, photographs until you come up with this, uh, you know, this statement. And the statement, as you saw, really boiled down to, you know, the, the view of the cowboy throughout the project, the, uh, the disappearance of the cowboy, you know, as well as the, uh, the horizon line and the, uh, you know, the role of industry throughout, throughout Carbon County. And I think, uh, I think the sequence we came out with, with that was, uh, spoke to that really, really well. Um, but that's for others to say as well, I guess. But, um, but yeah, previous to Carbon County, a lot of my projects followed more of a uh, strict, a linear narrative, like the railroads or the National Character Project. Well, um, I know you've put your email address up here as well as your website, so thank you for that. 
anybody yeah. who has follow-up questions, uh, I know that you all who are participants in this, you have my email address and you're welcome to send them to me to forward to John or you can reach out to John directly. And John, thank you in advance for, for answering any any questions that may be keeping people up at night. You know, they're processing this right, right. presentation now. Um, I'm gonna take a moment and turn this over to Andrew. Okay. okay. Uh, you who can see my um, background, um, I think it's relevant to what John is talking about. This is an image that the Figgy acquired several years ago, and, and John was referring to the Union Pacific Railroad. And this image is by Andrew Russell, who photographed a series of images for what became a book, and it was essentially a, a an advertisement for Union Pacific. Um, it's from the book, The Great West Illustrated, in a series of photographic views across the continent taken along the line of the Union Pacific Railroad west from Omaha, Nebraska. So that's a really long title for a book, but the image is important. And so for people who are interested in seeing this image in person, it is on the second, sorry, on the third floor um, in the first section of the exhibition. John's two photographs are on the third floor if you have not uh, been there. Um, and the last, what will be the last photograph in the publication is uh, John's image of the memorial for Wayne Martinez. Uh, but we have positioned it at the very front of the exhibition space in the third floor. So when you walk off the elevator, it will be on your right as you exit the elevator. And then the other image, um, of the uh, cattle uh, rustler, is that what you call it? What is the the uh, gentleman on the horse? Uh, cattle drive. Cattle drive. Yes, the cattle drive. Um, <laughs> that is go. paired. That is paired with uh, two other images. One an uh, image by Lee Friedlander, uh, and the other by Rebecca Norris Webb, who similar to John, did a series of images um, in her home state of. South Dakota. So it's a really interesting, um, and there are several of Rebecca's pieces in the exhibition. So we encourage you all to take a look at it if you haven't been to the museum to see it yet. Um, I think in during this time of COVID, um, the, the lower attendance actually gives people a moment to spend um, with each of the photographs and, and, and with 150 photographs, you're gonna need a lot of moments. But I do hope that you will spend time and enjoy these images, John's images in particular, uh, but the rest of the images in the exhibition, both on the first and third floor. Uh, because what uh, we hope this will allow you is an opportunity um, to better understand why photographers make the images that they do um, and try to get a sense or, or help you get a sense of their process. So thank you all for coming and um, thank you, Melissa, for hosting and thank you, John, for a wonderful talk. Thank you both, Andrew and Melissa, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you to all the attendees as well. Yeah, thank you all. And I just wanna say, as we wrap up the program for this evening, um, you know, John, for you sharing your talents and creativity with us, we appreciate that so much. We had, we had hoped to have you here to celebrate in person. Um, but I think that given the situation, this is the next best thing. So thank you for making it such a special evening. Andrew, thank you for all that you've done to make this exhibition a reality. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant exhibition. I know this is um, something you've been thinking about for a very long time and um, things changed rapidly right beforehand <laughs> and you've managed to just do an excellent job. So thank you to you and your team and congratulations. So I know well, many of our- Thank you very much. Yeah. Many of our audience members have already been to the museum and explored Magnetic West. For those of you who have yet to experience it, please make sure you go to the Figgy's website. We have updated information there on our museum hours, the visitor sessions, as Andrew mentioned, the recommended advanced registration and current policies and procedures for visiting the museum. We wanna make sure that when you come, you have as much time as possible, that you're staying safe and that you can enjoy being back at the Figgy again because um, I know that you've missed it. We know that you've missed it very much in these past few months. Um, in the meantime, we will continue to see you on these virtual programs. Definitely check out the upcoming Thursday evenings. Thank you again all for joining us this evening, and we will see you soon. Have a wonderful night. <laughs>